During this tutorial, we will go through the creation of an application. The first step is to agree on the business model, or data model, that will be handled by the application. This is what we call the design business model phase. The business model covers all application needs in terms of data. This includes the user interface, what should be displayed and what should be analyzed by the application user. This also includes the optimization engine requirements, what input data is needed and what output data will be generated. This phase also covers the data that comes from external systems or is published to external systems to ensure the availability of the external data and to clarify what will be generated by the application outcome. Designing properly this business data model is a key step in building an application. When using the platform, you will describe your business data model using the JDL language. JDL stands for JHipster Domain Language. JHipster is an open source project that allows describing in JDL a set of microservices that lets you generate part of the corresponding code automatically. In the platform context, we will use JDL only for the description of the business model. The remaining parts of the application will be generated using different tools. So, what do you describe in a JDL language? You describe entities. Each entity has simple attributes and may also have relationships with other entities. Finally, primary keys may be associated with entities to describe how instances of a given entity can be uniquely identified. Let's have a look at a simple case that we will be using during the whole tutorial. Our goal is to build a simple capacity planning application. Performing capacity planning means handling resources, handling activities, and scheduling those activities, taking into account the available resources and the activities' precedences. In our context, a resource, as you can see here, is declared with two attributes, an ID, which will be part of its primary key, and a name. Their source will also have a capacity which is described in the resource capacity entity. This entity has a quantity attribute which describes the amount of simultaneously available headcount for the corresponding resource. Note the declaration at the bottom of the screen. This is where we define the relationship between the resource and resource capacity entities. This is a recurring pattern which describes the simple attributes without the relationships at the top of the file and then describes the relationships between entities at the bottom of the file. If you look at the relationship definition, you can see that the resource capacity entity has a resource attribute which will point to a resource instance, and similarly, we have a capacity attribute on the resource entity which will be pointing back to the resource capacity instance. With those three declarations, the resource entity has three attributes, an ID, a name, and a capacity. The resource capacity entity has two attributes, a quantity, and a resource. This is the second part of our model. Here, we describe the activities that have to be performed by our resources. They are organized by precedence. When a precedence exists between two activities, one activity can start only after the other is finished. To describe this information, we use three declarations. The first describes the activity entity with its three attributes. The second describes the precedence entity and the last one describes the relationship between the two entities. If we summarize what we see here, the activity entity has five attributes, an ID, a name, duration in hours, successors, predecessors. The successors attribute will be a list of preferences, and the predecessors attribute will be a list of preferences. Similarly, the precedence entity has two attributes, an attribute named first, which is an activity, an attribute named second, which is also an activity. The first attribute of the precedence entity is linked with the successor's attribute of the activity entity. When one is changed, the other should be updated. Similarly, the second attribute of the precedence entity is linked with the predecessor's attribute of the activity entity. We have seen the link between activities and precedences. Now, Let's see how we describe the relationship between activities and resources. Each activity requires a certain amount of resources to be performed. We will use a new entity called requirement to represent this information. 
Looking at the relationship we have at the bottom of the screen, you can see that the requirement has three attributes. The resource quantity required, the activity that requires that quantity, the resource that is required. Because we have declared a relationship, we have also new attributes for the resource and activity entities. Each resource has a requirement attribute that contains the list of requirements attached to that resource. Each activity has a requirements attribute that is a list of requirements attached to that activity. We have seen the description of the main entities of our business data model. The activity, the resource, the requirement, the precedences, and resource capacity. There are some additional entities that are used to store the results produced by the engine. The schedule entity shows when an activity is performed in time and tells the resource that it is being used. The resource usage per day entity is a table that contains the number of hours a given resource has been given during a given day for the whole planning. Now that the code is JDL description is prepared, we can generate the application. This is done using the platform code generator. This generator will take your JDL as input and generate the code for the different parts of your application and all the developing configuration file that you need to build your application. Let's see how we generate an application. The application generator is built on top of Yeoman. Yeoman is an open source project that allows describing any kind of generators. To start the generator, type the yo db hyphen gene command. You are then prompted for the different properties of the application. The name of your application that should have no white spaces will be used throughout the generated code to identify the different parts of your application. A project description, which is a one-line text. The location where the project should be generated. The package that will be used to organize your Java code. The name of the collector, which will be the internal structure and will give you access to your data when writing your customizations. You have then to tell whether you are generating from a JDL file or from an IBM DOC 3.9 DBM file. And finally, you have to provide the path to the JDL file. The application is then generated. Let's have a look at the generated code. We have opened an integrated development environment from JetBrains. The folder that has been created is named after the name of your application. It contains several sub-projects. All projects can be organized by two parts, libraries and services. We will look at them in detail later. What is interesting here is that we have generated with your services the structure needed to build the application. We are using the Gradle open source building environment. All the parts of your application are defined and ready to be managed. The application can be built from the IDE, but can also be built directly from a command shell, which is what we will be doing here. We use Gradle to start building the application. This will do the following tasks. It will first go through the different projects and generate appropriate code when necessary. This typically includes generating the data model and some of the data service parts. It will then compile the Java code. It will finally compile the web user interface code. Note that those compilation phases require retrieving Java and JavaScript dependencies from external repositories. This means that this phase requires you to have internet access. The generated code contains all the files required to build your application. We also include in the generated application everything you need to create the Docker images out of your services. You also have access to different ways to start your application. Using IDE configurations for debugging purposes. Using pure Java processes for iterative testing. Using Docker Compose for local and integration deployment. Note that the platform does not include an integrated development environment. We are using JetBrains IntelliJ during this tutorial. The generated application is organized along with different sets of projects. We have libraries and we have services. Libraries will be typically placed where you have to write some code. 
This includes, for example, the optimization engine that you will need to implement and the data model checker. Then we have some services where you might want to do some customization. The back end and worker services where you will implement tasks. The front end service where you may add custom visualizations. The gene model project contains the implementation of your business data model. This is a set of Java classes that you will be able to use to access and manipulate your application data. Finally, we have what we call Gene Services, which are services where we do not expect you to have to do any extensions. This includes the Data Service, which will be storing the scenario data. Includes the Scenario Service, which will be storing scenario information, i.e. not the data, but the scenario information. There is an Execution Service, which is in charge of managing the execution of processing your data. Lastly, there is a gateway service, which is the entry point for your microservices once you have deployed the application. We have generated and built the application. It is now time to run it. Again, just like for the build phase, everything will be ready for you to run the application. Several processes will have to be run to have the full application available. There is the optimization server, which will manage all your execution of long and CPU-consuming processes. There is a set of infrastructure-related services dedicated to data management and communication between processes, and there are the application services. You can see on the right the whole list of services that will be run when you start the application. Looking from the top to the bottom, we will find the web user interface the back-end service which is used to run short data processing tasks, the execution service that is routing all information to and from the back-end, and the optimization server. There are the optimization server services required to run long CPU-consuming tasks, and there is the data management part, which is separated into two, the data service, which contains the scenario data, and the scenario service, which contains scenario information and other information like the dashboard description and properties that are related to scenarios but not directly linked with the data. There are multiple ways to start the different services. We can start them as Docker images. That is what we do when we move to production or when we have an advanced state of development. Or we can start them as Java processes from inside or outside of an integrated development environment. For this demonstration, we will start the application-specific services as Java processes and use Docker images for all the non-application-specific services. To start the infrastructure services, we go into the Deployment Docker Infra folder of the application. We can find here a Docker Compose file that is ready to be used. This command will start the database services, one to store the scenario data and the other to store the scenario descriptions. It will also start the generic optimization services, RabbitMQ and Job Database. We can start the optimization service components. We have a Docker Compose file ready to be used that can be activated with the Docker Compose command. This will start the master service, the web console, and the documentation of the optimization server. To check the different Docker containers running at this time, I can use the docker ps command. Now that the infrastructure services of the application are ready to be used, I can start my application-specific services. To do this, I go to the deployment shell folder. Inside this folder, I can find scripts ready to be used to start the different parts of the application. The script will make sure the service code is up to date and compiled. Start the service and log the service execution in the console. Similarly, I will start the data server, the scenario server, the execution service, the back-end service, and the web front-end service. We have started the different processes or services. It is now time to open the first browser on our application. The application can be found at localhost8080.
It provides a default login screen, and then it will give you access to the Scenario Home. This is where you will manage your scenarios and where you will start working with your data and your optimization engine.